Hi everyone, it's Gigi. I hope you can hear me. I'm using, I don't usually use my mic when I Facebook Live because I'm usually on my phone. But um, yeah, so hi, Happy New Year. I hope everyone's doing well. I have a new camera, I have a mic going on. Hopefully this setup will all work out well. And I just thought I'd do a Facebook Live here um, natively on Facebook. I know it's Friday and it's almost three o'clock, so I'm not sure how many people are going to be able to join, but I am going to give it a couple of minutes to see if anybody pops in um, or if I'm just going to be talking to myself. Hi, Mia. How are you? It's good to see you. It's my, I, I listened to Mia. I took very good advice and did not let my messy background get in the way. So welcome to my messy background. And my poster that I got from Italy, you can't see it. I pulled that off of a wall in Rome um, when I was there the first time when I was 16 years old. There had been a, a um, festival there just a few weeks before, and I saw that poster and I had to have it and bring it home. So I have that one and another one that I painstakingly took off of this giant cinder block wall and rolled up and stashed in my suitcase and brought it home. So that's one of my favorite things. I thought it'd be good to put behind me. So yeah, um, can you hear me okay? Okay, well Mia, this just might be you and I, and you already know this story, so you're going to get to hear it again. Mm. I hope you guys are all doing well. I hope you had a great holiday and New Year's. Um, we had an amazing Christmas around here. Actually, the kids um, made it fun. So if you guys are have kids or are near kids during Christmas, it's a totally different experience, but it was a good one. And um, I will tell you that I wanted to come on and share about some things that happened just after Christmas. Um, I'm telling you this story for really no other reason other than the fact that once I had this experience, it became really clear to me that there was no way I was the only woman on the planet who's had this experience. And I'm actually going to be um, talking about this in several different forums. Um, the first one is going to be Healthcare is Hilarious with the mighty Casey Quinlan. She's asked me to come on her podcast and talk about this. So that date is TBD. And um, also I'm going to be doing a live stream about these things as well. So what happened, you might ask. Um, so right after Christmas, and and Mia, I'm really glad that you're here. I'm, I'm really bummed. Usually I get about 30 people at least on a live by now. Um, but we're just going to go forward and hopefully you guys can share it as you come across. Um, yes, this is um, shit we don't talk about, Mia. This is very, very true. So why aren't we talking about it? So look, I'm 48. I turned 48 in December. Um, and back in September, I started having some really weird health stuff that I just couldn't, um, couldn't explain and went to the doctor and was treated for GERD and was treated for um, really just basically was told no testing was done, did a physical exam, my symptoms were I had really spotty periods, I had really bad indigestion, and um, I wasn't sleeping, and I was tired. Now, I know when I went to the doctor for anything in my 30s, even up through the time that I had Spencer, I um, the first question anybody asked me was, could you be pregnant? And I was like, no, or yes, because I was twice in my 30s. Um, but this time around, I went and I gave all these symptoms, and I was put on a meprazol, which is um, certainly not a drug you do want to take if you are pregnant, heads up, but it's awesome for gastrointestinal distress, which my doctor determined I had in the first three minutes of seeing me. Um, and long story short, about six weeks later, um, that was managing my symptoms, but I still didn't feel great. Had increasing symptoms, achy joints, really tired, really bad indigestion. Um, two days after Christmas, I actually had a miscarriage at about 14 weeks, 12 to 14 weeks is the best guess, um, pregnant. And that was despite having been to the doctor, having given really clear complaints um, with my medical issues and concerns, um, having not been tested for pregnancy, having been told for like the last year that I'm very um, seriously perimenopausal and really kind of not to be concerned with that. So you might say, why didn't you take one? I never felt pregnant. I, you know, it certainly didn't feel pregnant like I did the last two times I was pregnant. I just felt ill. 
so it didn't dawn on me to go at you know 47 48 years old um kind of go pee on a stick quite frankly so i was really shocked um to have this miscarriage i was more shocked when the next day i was still in an intense amount of pain that was only getting worse that the only option that i had was to go to the emergency room and that is for a series of things that happened that i'm not going to get into the details here now because it's something that we're going to be talking about so I want to save that for Casey's podcast, which is Healthcare is Hilarious, and we're going to be doing um, a conversation about perimenopause and women, and really the shit we don't talk about when it comes to that. Um, also, there's not a whole lot of data out there. I, I looked for perimenopausal pregnancy, and, and I'll, I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Um, but yeah, the only option I had after going through this whole thing on my own in a very shocked way you know, having to tell John, I think we just had a miscarriage. I think I just had a miscarriage. And then the um, scare of really being in some really intense pain of things getting better and then ramping up and getting worse quickly in the next 24 hours, um, being sent to the emergency room. And really, I knew I needed an ultrasound and I needed pain management. And I thought the two pla you know, the one place where I know this is going to take the longest is going to be in the emergency room. I mean, I'm going for a test in pain management and I'm going to the ER because really I had no other option. I called my my family doctor who I wasn't thrilled with because, you know, quite frankly, she, she treated me for a condition um, that I didn't have and didn't explore as a patient other conditions I could have, like being pregnant. Um, when I called her and told her I thought I had a miscarriage, they explained it away with lots of different things. There, there's many things. but. Um, between my GP, my gynecologist, and I even called Planned Parenthood because I thought perhaps they could help me more quickly, at least to diagnose, did I indeed have a miscarriage and what were my health risks at this point? Um, Planned Parenthood wasn't an option because their funding has been cut so much they no longer have any ultrasound equipment in any of their offices, at least in this tri-state area. So uh, off to the ER I went, and I was there for about eight hours, I want to say, give or take from the waiting room to the time I was sent home. Um, I had to argue for pain management because surprise, surprise, my blood work came back positive that I was indeed pregnant. And the doctor on call did not want to order any pain management for me that could harm my pregnancy, regardless of the fact that I've just reported to this man in no uncertain terms that I have just had a miscarriage and in fact, I'm in the middle of one. Um, he didn't want to give me any pain management until I had the ultrasound, which was going to take a lot of time um, because uh, they were really backed up. There had been a horrible accident, just lots of different circumstances. So I'm now in the ER, worst place to be, reporting a miscarriage at 48 years old, didn't know I was pregnant, I was about 12 weeks pregnant. Health hasn't been managed to this point despite all the symptoms I've been reporting to my family doctor. Um, and um, and now being denied pain management because I have a positive pregnancy test and they don't want to put the pregnancy that I've just told them I've miscarried in jeopardy. So um, it actually got a little worse before it got better. I did have a great nurse in the ER who, who fought and at least got me some pain management so that we were able to get through the rest of the day and some other actually really horrific things that happened um, even at the hands of my OB my, my gynecologist, I should say, in the ER. So after going through this experience, after getting, you know, after being pregnant twice and knowing really what pregnancy feels like and being very versed in it and still being pregnant for basically an entire first trimester and not knowing it and then miscarrying and then having to seek medical care, um, I've decided that, um, you know, once again, the, the, the the journalist in me kicks in and I'm going to be doing a live stream. I have an awesome network and we're working to get people um, in really the top echelons in healthcare to come on and have this conversation. Um, part of the reason I will say that, you know, I think I managed my health the way I did um, was an insurance issue. You know, you can't, so, so as somebody who's a self-employed person, if you make under a certain threshold, you qualify for Medicaid. That threshold keeps increasing and decreasing. If you're borderline, they won't put you on the ACA until you apply for Medicaid and possibly get rejected or don't get rejected. You better do that really quickly because the Medicaid application process is really long. Um, 
and if you apply and don't stay up to date with your um, reporting of your income, you will get washed out of the system, or if your income changes to the point where you no longer qualify, you will get washed out of the system. So I found myself washed out of the Medicaid system, not qualifying for ACA because I had to reapply for Medicaid and get rejected, um, and not qualifying through um, one of the agencies I freelance with and temp with who bring me clients uh, because I was no longer on a current assignment through them. So I found myself in this donut hole um, of worrying about the cost of health care and actually one of the reasons I didn't want to go to the ER in addition to the fact that I knew the ER was not the place to manage a miscarriage, um, I was worried about the health care costs. So we've got health care in the middle of all this. Uh, my friend Jane Saracen Khan sent me some amazing data from Kaiser and it I was really happy to see that the, the Kaiser 2017 data says that we're down to one in 10 women reporting that they're uninsured in 2017, um, which is a 12% uninsurance rate down from 18% just four years prior to that in 2013. So I think that insurance rates are good. Um, however, we still have a really high uninsurance rates among lower income women. And statistically, that means single parents, that means women, single mothers, women of color, um, and if you're already lower income and then you're at a greater pregnancy risk and then you can't get the health care and then the health care you do get is not um, talking to the perimenopausal patient or at least not treating the perimenopausal patient with in my which was my experience the same standard of care um, you know I, I'm not here I'm not going to be speaking about my doctors by name I will say that to go to a GP and report you know, spotty periods for two months, fatigue and illness and not be um, even questioned about pregnancy, but rather put on another drug that would jeopardize, you know, I have no way of knowing if this even started out as a healthy pregnancy and it turned because of the drug or if it was just a bad pregnancy from the start. Um, then there's all the emotional things of the fact that, you know, there was a pregnancy and there's been a miscarriage and processing all this, you know, sort of becoming a um, National Enquirer punchline of the person who didn't know they were pregnant. Um, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but I do want to say that I, I want to thank Mia Voss, Jane Saracen Khan, Casey Quinlan, Anna Pern, um, Samantha Small, Amy Vernon, Shireen Mitchell, and, and Jane Boyd, as well as my family, um, for all the support, uh, because from December 27th, to now has been quite a roller coaster ride. This time a week ago, I was in the emergency room um, trying to get pain management and determine exactly what was going on with my body and confirm that yes, in fact, um, you know, I, I had miscarried an unknown pregnancy. Um, and then also process in my head, why is the healthcare system just completely failed at this point? You know, when really since October, November, I'd been seeking medical treatment for um, for bad health. You know, I knew something was wrong. I, I spent weeks saying something is just not right. Uh, I don't want to diagnose myself. I didn't go to medical school. I want the experts to be able to chime in. And I look forward to, um, I, I don't want to name drop at this point, but I will tell you that I am reaching out to, as I said, experts in the top echelon of medicine and women's health to have a conversation about how did we get here and how can we do better? Um, because I did find some census data, this was from July 2017, there were 10 and a half million women in the United States between the ages of 45 and 49, which is prime perimenopausal age. 10 and a half million. How are we failing 10 and a half million people? And I'm sure those numbers have only increased. Um, and then you've got the knock-on side effects. You know, when, when something like this happens, it often doesn't just happen to one person. It happens to a family. You know, we've got kids processing this. We've got partners processing this. And why are doctors, it seems, listening to their patients less? There's been an amazing movement um, to be patient-centric. And, you know, once again, if I had walked into a doctor's office at age 34 or 35, and said I'm having spotty periods, indigestion, exhaustion, um, coupled with an inability to sleep, coupled with achy joints, I think a pregnancy test would have been on the, you know, one of the first things that happened rather than I'm going to put you on this drug 
and I'm not going to do any blood work until you've been on this drug for two to three weeks. So um, that's really, I am coping with this quite, you know, I, I'm processing this. I'm coping with it. Um, I appreciate all the support and all the messages and, and thank you guys so much. Um, this isn't really about me hanging in as much as it's about me using my voice and, you know, leveraging my network to, um, to have contacts, to be able to do what, one of the things I do best, which is really interview people. I'd much rather be sitting here with somebody asking them questions than just sitting here talking to you. So thank you for indulging me while I do this solo. I'm much better on camera when I've got somebody who I can have a foil and do a question and answer session. Um, so this is really about doing some digging and saying, if this can happen to me, um, somebody who has access to good hospitals and access to care and, you know, access to insurance, even though I did find myself in this giant donut hole of access, um, what's going on in the rest of the country? What's going on for women of color whose maternal mortality rate is already so much higher? Where are they falling in this? What's going on with the portion of women who are still uninsured? Um, you know, Planned Parenthood is not on the table now. If you need an ultrasound, I, I don't know if you guys heard that, but the funding has been cut so much. I, I really didn't want to have to go to the ER and wait as long as I had to wait for an ultrasound. Um, to confirm what was going on and why I was still in so much pain. But finding out that there are no, there's no ultrasound equipment. I mean, Planned Parenthood provides women's health services, women's reproductive health services. And to be able to do that with, um, out the necessary equipment or to be expected to do that is just shocking to me. So I look forward to this conversation. I look forward to, um, the opportunity to be on Casey Quinlan's podcast. Healthcare is hilarious and start this conversation there. I look forward to the opportunity um, to interview some folks and I will be releasing the names and the dates uh, for that broadcast. We're gonna be doing it across the interwebs. I look forward to um, some other radio and broadcast opportunities coming up to tell this story and to really looking for more data. There's not a lot of data out there when you Google you know, perimenopause and pregnancy. It talks about all the different ways that you can get pregnant rather than talking about um, risks, you know, prevention tends to be, um, excuse me, for women tends to be low dose birth control pills, which if you're at risk for cancer or you're above 45, you have a much higher risk with those. IUDs, which I read that the um, miscarriage rate is very high with, and I certainly wouldn't want to go through that pain and have an IUD as well. So the more investigation I do, and the more um, lack of opportunity and option that I see for, for women, um, the more it, it makes me wonder. So I look forward to these conversations. I look forward to the opportunity to do these interviews and to talk to some really leading experts in women's health and to really find out, excuse me, <clears throat> how this could have been handled differently, how a miscarriage could have been avoided and what we could have done. <coughs> Sorry, guys. My time is up. I'm going to go. Thanks for joining. <laughs>